Welcome to today's episode, ladies and gents, where regardless of the question, education is the answer. I'm very grateful for Matei accepting my invitation because today we're going to talk about the amazing return on investment, self-development, professional development, self-investment, education brings in the long run and how much grunt work is in the process for others to enjoy some of the result and the shine. But they, thanks for being with us today. Hey, hey Doris, how's it going? Great to see you again. Great to see, great to see you, great to hear you, and I'm glad that we can have this conversation public, right, uh, recorded for everybody who's listening, because I think you're exceptional, you're an exceptional candidate when it comes to the uh, investment made in education, the scholarships you had, uh, the um, let's say that the hockey stick trajectory uh, they had in terms of uh, post uh, middle and high school uh, education and eventually I think the past in that you had a, a tier one consulting firm and we're talking about management consulting firm that got you where you are today okay so I don't want to uh, spoil the the news you're about to share with everybody about yourself and your CV so far and what what has been the journey so please uh, you make the introductions and the presentation and I'm, I'm gonna step in when you're gonna be too modest okay all right all right I mean let, let me preface this by saying I I was also fortunate right uh, so it's it's not all my kind of uh, my achievements I think context is very important so I want to highlight you the importance of having the having a supportive family and a supportive environment uh, and I think we'll, we'll get into that a bit more just later on. Uh, but let, let me spend, as you said, maybe one, two minutes to introduce quickly what, what I've been doing recently. Um, so after my uni, um, so I, I did my university in, in Italy, UK, and US, um, I decided to jump into strategy consulting with BCG. So I spent roughly two years in consulting um, as an associate in BCG, a senior associate in OCNC. Um, I was working with investment funds in both London and Dubai. I was helping them essentially uh, perform due diligence for the various investments they were doing, either either kind of external investments or um, let's say country level investments, uh, which were directed towards local infrastructure initiatives. After consulting, I decided perhaps this is not the career path I want to follow through in the longer term. I decided to jump into the venture world. I decided to kind of uh, join the BizOps team of a venture called Blue Ground. Blue Ground is a very interesting company, I think. Uh, it was founded in Greece. It, uh, it expanded in, in three other countries, the UAE and Turkey, um, with its first one and a half, two years of existence, right? It was founded, by the way, 10 years ago on this one. Afterwards, um, it, it essentially rapidly, rapidly expanded after a series A into the US and, and the rest of Europe. What it really does, it's, it's a prop tech, right? So that really means a venture in the intersection of technology and real estate. What we do is we, we help investment funds with real estate assets optimize their returns. That means taking on their assets with the um, shorter or longer term leases and then passing them on to, to either consumer, uh, consumers or corporates. And we've been doing so by actually taking on um, the full, let's say, risk associated with an asset. Right? So that, that means kind of a master lease model. This is this was the initial kind of business model. And now we're moving towards a model in which we become more of an operator. So we provide know-how, we provide infrastructure technology, um, and therefore we become a bit more asset light and more scalable. Um, so th this is a bit about the ground where I kind of currently work. Um, and I'm uh, currently leading this ops for Bolivia and Asia. So I have roughly 50 markets, um, let's say, under my wings. And I think it's close to two years now. I'm with Blue Ground. It's been really exciting. Um, and yeah, happy to, to delve into that a bit more. That's quite a journey. Uh, I got a couple of questions out there. And uh, I'm going to point out towards them so we can, uh, let's say, go a bit more granular, but also clear the air uh, for non-tech folks or non-savvy folks listening. So guys, if you if you have a property that you are willing to lease in the long run and you're looking to make a partnership with a 
large company that's got to guarantee you revenue for the next 10 to 15 to 20 years, that's what Blue Ground is interested in in terms of the assets that you have over there. Now, it might be the situation that you have to make some investments. The other might, might be made by the company itself. But Mate here will make sure that there's a revenue streamline, whether you know, you're in holiday or whether you're home, if you are ready to lease that property, right? So this is about uh, Blue Ground. Uh, and I actually for love that. I love, I love the I'm kind of uh, explaining what, what we do. Can you can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Sorry, there was a, a connection problem. So I'll I'll go back with my conclusion so I can cut at least this and then okay, let me just have the captions yeah, yeah, yeah. go away. I'm so sorry about this. So I'll... It might be the I think it might be the some noise. So I'm, I'm very interested in helping folks that have properties understand how they can work with you, Matei, and the company that you represent, right? The mammoth over behind this. Guys, if you have a lease, uh, sorry, if you have a property and you don't know exactly what to do with it or how to make it work for you or bring a return on investment, there might be some investments you have to make up front. The others might be made by uh, Blue Ground over here. But the bottom line is, Mate can offer you a deal so that the next 15 to 20 years, you have a revenue streamline over there uh, and, and you can do something else. And without the headaches of actually constantly having to manage that property, which for those of you that are actually in the real estate business so far, there's a lot of headache for just a, a bigger commission over there. Mate, was that a pretty accurate presentation of what people can do with properties if they get in touch with you? Yeah, so actually, I love the way you kept it simple, and I think it's it's a pretty good representation. I think maybe it's it's slightly more nuanced, and I'm happy to kind of delve into the details. Uh, I I think maybe one thing worth mentioning is what we're trying to do, and many many competitors in the space are also trying to do the same thing. Is we're trying to define maybe a new real estate asset in the market because right now, if you're an investor of a real estate investment fund, you have to pick probably between two two extremes, right? So one extreme is kind of going for uh, the hospitality space. So that really means a hotel, right? Uh, what's a hotel? It's a real estate uh, residential asset where people come in, they check in for a couple of nights, could be up to a week, and then kind of they, they keep on going on their way. Um, occupancy levels in, in the hotel space aren't necessarily great all around the Europe. Yeah. So you, can, you can imagine um, a hotel in a very touristy uh, place in, let's say, the south of Spain. Mm -hmm. Well, it, 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 if you kind of go there in January, you might notice that they're not doing great in terms of occupancy, right? 50% might be a good number for January in yeah. the south of Spain. Now, you have to imagine at the other extreme, you've got residential assets for long term living. So think of, think about the apartments in large cities where you have kind of tenants year round, 12 month contracts, 24 month, 48 month contracts, right? So the really, really long term stuff. Uh, now, the question is, uh, is it worth looking at something in between, right? So not not two nights, not one week, but not 48 months either. And I think this is where we come in, right? And we're trying to define this kind of third third way of looking at residential real estate assets, which is uh, we believe you have higher margins as a real estate investor um, in, in this space. Because on the one hand, you don't have the low occupancy of hotels, which low occupancy, by the way, means so much revenue lost but also at the other end um, because of this extra kind of volatility on top versus longer term rents you can also make some extra profit right so of course it's a bit of a battle trying to let's say argue in front of real estate investors that have been in the space for probably decades that this this uh, third if you'd like type of asset exists 
but I think we're we're making significant inroads. Um, I think I think this is what kind of I, I think this is the way you kind of want to see this industry uh, moving. Let's say pop tech. What I'm reading between the lines over here is untapped potential, and we're talking about business travel over here. Uh, mainly, right? And I and I think you know you and I have have spent you know significant time with clients in different countries, right? So we know how important it is to have a bit of a home feeling, and rather just just being the hotel experience over there. So from this point of view, I think there's an untapped potential, especially for those traveling with spouses or uh, you know kids over there, but. I want to make an analogy for uh, those management consultants or future management consultants out there doing case studies right now. So, guys, there there are questions like, could you tell me what's the uh, you know the total number of TV of TVs that the population of a country would buy? And you start you know segmenting the market over there and thinking of people, and 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 then and then you, you realize that that's not the accurate number because you've ignored companies that can buy so many TVs, uh, you know, and, and businesses over there, and offices, and schools, and, and and nursing homes. That's the untapped potential that doesn't really show there on paper. Maybe some of the investors which are new over here might not see it, but the money is out there. And what Mate and Blue Ground is trying to do is make this market not be virgin anymore and uh and show and lead the way and pioneer in this industry of traveling for business what do you think of this analogy Mate? yeah i i i think there is untapped potential look um and i think more importantly it's worth clarifying that i don't think we're trying to take away market share from, from hotels I, I think we're trying to tap into a market that wasn't there before yeah. um Particularly post COVID, you have to imagine the number of digital nomads skyrocketing, right? Yeah. Uh, business travel is also back on. I think people want a more personalized experience. They want to feel that the moment they kind of land in a new city, they have a they have a home. And I think this is what we're doing at the end of the day. It's it's turnkey. I think this is the term we use. It's turnkey homes, right? Um, so for me, and this is why I I, I joined the company as a form of traveling consultant, right? Um, I feel that I missed out on that personalized experience. I want to actually have a home when I'm in a new city. And this is what we're I'm striving to offer. And I think we, we also help, like, if you want to take a step back and look at the bigger picture, there are a lot, a lot of residential assets in, in major cities, which are, I guess, for lack of a better word, a bit run down, right? So they're, they're not great in terms of furnishing. Um, they've been perhaps a bit dilapidated, and and what we do is at the end of the day we also help kind of restoring many of these residential units. Right, uh, they might be beautiful buildings, but inside they they don't look as good. Right, um, and we, at the end of the day, what we do is we also help in restoring some of these what what could be amazing apartments, mm -hmm. but which were maybe neglected in, in some sort of sense. Right. Yeah, it's definitely a win-win because you know the owners might be. Uh taxed additionally on that asset for not having the you know the, the proper status quo right. the, the yeah. renovation so that's a big plus another plus is the revenue stream it's constant you don't have to go through the hustle some of the investments you guys make them uh so again this is important and you know at, at the end of the day uh besides your home which is mandatory if you have a, a an asset and doesn't produce anything it's just consuming money so uh, I think this is, you know, the, the, the most important philosophical point of view from this business that someone that owns an asset should keep in mind before getting in touch uh, with you. So thanks for the explanation over there and what the company does. Um, and I'm going to I'm going to uh, use another example that came to my mind because everybody's familiar with Airbnb and everybody's familiar with booking. OK, and I think we have these two extremes over there. Uh, I think they don't cater as we exemplified over here for the long-term stay or for the business stay. But for the folks listening and are familiar with these apps, just imagine somewhere in the middle, but if you're traveling for business. So that's the easiest way to understand this concept of the current scale-up that Mate is working in, which has been evaluated to how much, Mate? Well, uh, right now, I think I, I, it's safe to say we're we're soon to right? So we're about to share some exciting news. But uh, as of now, I think it's seven hundred and fifty million, right? And 
you know, some some news are pending. Let me, let me put it at that. Well, I I think for the uh, the the folks out there, which you know maybe are thinking that unicorns are are something way beyond the financial valuation over there, we're talking about one B USD, right? So we're talking about one billion company valuation, guys. So this is a pretty big deal from a startup to a scale up. That's why it's a big deal, right? Because uh, we we hear today that you know news about Series A and Series B and being evaluated 10, 20 million. I think that's great. I think that's fantastic, especially coming from the East to US, which is the the same path that you've presented over here. But guess what, guys? This is one billion. This is not twenty. This is this is not fifty. This is not one hundred. Is one billion. So I think that's very excited, and I'm very happy for you, Matei. But I'm also, you know, I also feel the pain, bro, because I know what BizOps is about. So I want us to deep dive a bit about what, what is this? What is this BizOps? And, and are you some sort of uh, jack of all trades? Do you have a magic wand? What is this BizOps about? It's, uh, it's just a fancy word. No, I'm joking. Uh, it's, <laughs> look, at, uh, it, it's such a new role, I feel, in the tech world that everybody does it differently. It stands for, for business operations, which is probably the most corporate uh, combination of words you, you've ever heard. But what, what it really is at the end of the day is, at least for Blue Ground, is a team which sits at the intersection of, I'd say, strategy and data. Mm -hmm. And it really helps senior leadership connect their strategic design with the relevant data and push through and implement all, all the critical kind of tactical decisions to grow, right? So it's just making sure that whatever growth we achieve is, is profitable. Um, what this really means for me, myself, is that I'm the, if you want to see it one way, I'm the connective tissue sitting between all of the functions that are key to unlocking growth. So that could be finance, that could be business intelligence, that could be channel marketing, um, and that could be the, the boots on the ground during the day, operations, right? Um, I, I think it's worth mentioning that if, if you look into other tech firms, BizOps might do slightly different things, right? So, for example, LinkedIn has a BizOps team, right? Google has a BizOps team. It doesn't mean they're going to do the same stuff. I think, if I'm not mistaken, BizOps and LinkedIn is much closer to their strategy team, kind of informing strategy execution and making sure the implementation is up to par. While for Google, I feel it's more operational, right, for lack of a better word. So I feel that it's more making sure that um, you have kind of the right infrastructure in terms of processes. Um, so again, really, really varies. But at the end of the day, I think this is what you, have, you need to have in mind. Um, it's, it's really the connective tissue sitting between a lot of the teams that are key to, to unlocking growth and profitability. For uh, uh, an additional explanation over here to the connecting tissue over there, we can think of a liaison role with a public speaking or public facing component we can think of a jack of all trades that is here to streamline processes flows and communication while building executive summaries for investors and boards and i think uh, last but not least uh, it can be made an analogy for the it folks out there as the difference between you know uh, someone that works in devops right <laughs> we just take the dev out and we put the biz component so everybody can yeah yeah, yeah. that's a understand. nice way to put it yeah, yeah that's so, a nice way to put it so okay non-technical devops like. yeah so non-technical devops that could be a, a bit of an uh, easier way to uh, understand it but of course it's easy for us now to talk about definitions but we know in practice that this is a quite a stretching role uh, that comes with, especially considering the 15 markets you have to oversee, maybe the clock might be more of an accessory than, you know, being followed in a very classical nine to five way. So um, I would like us to touch upon some of the, the challenges in, in performing in such a role and, and some of the joy that it brings you. Right. Let me, I guess, let me start with challenges. Right. Let me just see Let's mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I think, yeah, as you said, it's time consuming. What I do love about the role itself and the blue ground is that there is some flexibility in how you execute, right? So I, I've never seen in blue ground the idea of micromanagement. Mm -hmm. uh, having flexibility for your own role is both 
good and bad. Good in the sense that you're the master of your own kind of schedule and you're the master of your own decisions. Bad that sometimes, of course, and, and I think this is the case for all startups and scale-ups, um, the lack of structure means you might not be as efficient as you'd like. But you also need to be agile, right? So it's, it's a trade-off between agility and kind of optimization. And I think we're, we're striking the right balance. And this ops itself is to strike the right balance. So lack of lack of structure maybe is, is also a thought, but it's also a pro. So let, let me start with saying that. Uh, working hours can, can be tougher, but I think coming from consulting, that's almost only something. Like <laughs> and to walk in uh, the park. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you could say that. You could say that. And then something else I'd mention is uh, also being a bit stretched in terms of mental bandwidth, because you uh, so sometimes you you know you you can work on your own kind of uh, quarter long projects, and sometimes you require fighting, uh, which is really interesting because your mind needs to be in ten places at the same mm -hmm. time, right? So and and different markets have different requirements and different urgent needs. But I think that that's something maybe a bit different from consulting. So for for our listeners who might have been consultants or part of their consultants, I feel in consulting you focus very very well on a on a project, right? And of course, you might have different streams. But your your focus is quite singular, which which is great because I think I, I, the the ability and the skill to be focused very kind of, and very dedicated to one topic is an, a a must skill I, I I feel. At the same time, in a scale up or a startup, uh, a a role similar to BizOps kind of forces you to be many places at the same time. So maybe, maybe these are some of the challenges. Some of the pros, as I said, flexibility has to be one. So you you choose what you want to work on, but you also are Kind of forced to prioritize the the right stuff and what's really kind of driving ROI. Um, another pro is, look, you need being the connected tissue. You meet with a lot of teams on a weekly basis, right? So you start to actually really understand what channel marketing does. Which, by the way, I had no clue how it worked before joining the ground, right? Before joining the venture. Um, I get to interact with uh, the ops teams, right? No clue what operations, at least at, at this kind of level of granularity, what operations really meant before joining the startup. Uh, I get to interact with product teams, business intelligence. And it's really, really fantastic kind of learning a lot from all of these functions. Right? So you can almost think of this as, as a general management role. But as opposed to a general management role, you have the advantage of not having to sit in the ivory tower. So you need to roll up your sleeves, you need to understand what each team does and what each each team needs from the wider organization. And then you have the, the privilege, if you'd like, to execute on common projects. So it's really learning a lot of stuff in a really short amount of time. This is maybe the, the one thing I like most about the world. And I think this is the perfect segue towards uh, a higher executive level. And I think there's there's no shortcuts you can take over here. And I took a couple of notes. Uh, Usually when I talk with folks about the lack of structure and the flexibility in executing work, I it, it's reassuring because I know a, a thousand percent with certainty that they're highly organized, self self uh, you know self planning over their uh, self discipline, and and independent in execution and taking the lead. Without these four or five qualities, it's pointless. It, it's actually worse to have lack of structure and flexibility. So. Hearing you say that, I know from experience that, that those are some of your qualities, just to point out there. Not that, that we're trying to sell you at any company over here through this podcast. Um, I think working without having a clue in which um, red ocean you're being thrown is something that we should be grateful that we had these, these experiences. And it's something, one of the, the strongest suit that a consultant, a tier one consultant, you would, you would immediately know he or she. The moment they start swimming in the red ocean uh, where they don't know anything and they start working with their hypotheses and educated assumptions and extracting data from specialists. So hearing you say that right now in your role uh, when, you know, took me back to my IT days where I had no idea about the IT industry right, and the BPO industry. But how similar is the process from consulting and extracting data from a client so that eventually you can make educated assumptions which are yes or no uh, recommendations for the uh, executive team. So kudos for keeping that skill, for sharpening that skill. I think that's going to be uh, very rewarding uh, in the future. 
And as for the trenches versus ivory tower or spreadsheets, some of the worst possible decisions that I've seen made by VCs and investors in general are based on spreadsheets. And not, not hearing out what the people with the mud on the boots have to say about their experience in the trenches. Uh, some of the best things that I could collect was just going down on the line with the folks, with the agents spending time over there or the developers and seeing where this frustration gets to be built because eventually it's very easy to get a punch from the client and the client is always right. But, you know, that leads to a lot of frustration. So I'm, I'm happy to hear you're deep diving into the trenches and rolling your sleeves over there. And, and don't, don't, lose, don't lose this because this will be very, again, something very rewarding. Thanks for uh, pointing out there the pros and cons from your point of view. Um, I want us to go a bit, uh, you know, uh, in the early days and talk about the pivotal decision of you investing time in education. I mean, there were a lot of uh, holidays you might have missed, a lot of PlayStation sessions, a lot of, you know, walking in the park just for the sake of going to the Olympics or, or you know, studying for an exam or doing the GRE, the GMAT, the so on and so forth. And I think it's very hard to get the mental strength at that age where you're not emotionally mature, you don't have a plan yet, you're just hungry to make a point over there through your uh, mental capacity. So what did you learn back then at, the, at an early age and how did you use that to become who you are today? I think as, as I prefaced uh, initially, it, it, it really is also molded by the environment you're in. So I think you, you yourself will be able to kind of develop that mental strength, as you mentioned, without a supporting environment, without supporting parents. Um, and, and I was lucky from an early age to actually be placed in environments that helped develop kind of the, the mental strength you're going to, right? So my parents, for example, placed me, I think, in, in, in my fifth grade in, in one of the top uh, high schools for computer science in, in Romania, right? Um, and I was, I was actually participating in a lot of contests in maths mm -hmm. so before that, right? So there was kind of a, um, a segue into that. But, but the moment you're there, um, the thing is, uh, giving up, to, to kind of quote you there, giving up PlayStation sessions uh, doesn't feel that bad anymore because you know the rest of the environment does the same, right? Um, and at, at the end of the day, identifying with your environment and being an integral part of your environment it, it is something which is very conducive towards excellence, I think, I think right? So it's very hard to, to build towards excellence when the when you feel you're the only one kind of striving towards it in your environment. So let, let me start by saying that. At the same time, of course, there, there's there's a bit of a time investment. At times, it might feel stressful. But I never I never looked at sacrifices that way, right? So I always thought, look, um, if I enjoy what I'm doing, it's uh, it's no longer a sacrifice, right? It just feels it feels right. Um, and that's why it's quite crucial to kind of develop early on. And I was lucky to do that. I understand what you enjoy. For me, it was maths from an early age. So I, I, um, I think during my sixth grade, I was a silver medalist nationwide for, for maths. And this love for maths kind of stuck with me throughout my entire life. Um, and this is kind of why I'm saying, look, you, you need to develop mental resilience to, to achieve whatever you want to do, whether it's academics, whether it's you know, professional achievements. But at the same time, I think it's very important to look at the context that you're in, both in terms of, hey, this is my community. Uh, this is what I can rely on in terms of support. This is what I enjoy doing. And just make sure that everything else is, is right before you kind of fell uh, at first into, into whatever you want to do. Uh, maybe sorry for being a bit too vague here. No, I'm no. happy to kind of uh, detail a bit more. But I guess the, the bottom line of what I'm trying to say here is just be... Be, be, be mindful of the environment you're in, whatever you think about that. And if you're lucky and you get a shot, don't waste it, right? So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Also that, of course, of course. And, you know, it was funny because uh, I just had an epiphany while you were walking through this uh, uh, entire process, uh, looking back from your childhood and the early days and, and recapping some of the events that were... Um, glorifying the milestone that you've reached, like the medals and the Olympics and everything. And I was 
I was just thinking that, you know, I, 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 being a teacher in British schools overseas and, and having a, a, a classic education myself from a former communist country, it just made me realize how different this will be in the day when you'll have to sell yourself, regardless of the profession, right? Because in, 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 in this, uh, you know, post-communistic uh, education, it was like, if you're good on math and, and, and sciences, that's it. That's the end of the day. That's all that matters. It's physics, chemistry, uh, computer science, and maths, and the rest are something like, you know, it would be nice to know something about it, like a general culture over there. But they would, they, they would put no emphasis on social skills, presentations, and I was in, uh, very often in environments such as, you know, t being with people from UK or US competing for the role, right? And they, I, I would always feel like, oh my God, these guys have some great presentation skills and sales skills. I mean, they don't know maybe half <laughs> of everything that they're presenting over there exactly as they're presenting it because you could have like a couple of questions and you would catch the BS over there, right? You would quickly realize that they're not that well prepared. And they would present something like that's something you must have in your company otherwise you, would, otherwise you would fail. So I was always fascinated about these social skills, right? And I wanted to ask your point of view of how important are these to be developed from an early age and, and how did you experience the the... the let's say, the shortage you had over there, if you had it? Uh, look, I, so I was born, back to your initial point, I was born a number of years after, after the, the fall of the Berlin Wall, so can't say I, I've experienced uh, the communist educational system. However, I'm sure even today, back in Romania, you can feel the remnants of that system. Uh, let, let me try to explain. As you said, strong focus on, on the exact sciences, which, by the way, I think is such an understated advantage that the kind of Eastern European countries have. However, the, the lack of focusing on, I, I think it's, it's, it's more the presentation skills. It's, it's um, whatever we call soft skills, and that includes critical thinking. And I know it's an overused term, but what I really mean by critical thinking is being able to uh, build a strong argument based on data and then to present it in a very detailed structure and succinct manner. And I think this is maybe one skill uh, that actually we Romanians kind of lack in our school. I think we're trying, I think the educational system is trying to develop it, uh, but not, not fast enough. And how I realized that is I had a bit of a culture shock, if you'd like, when I, when I left at 18 my country and went for my bachelor's in Italy. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I'm not going to say the Italian educational system is, is the US educational system or the UK educational system. So it's, it, it sits somewhere in between uh, the Eastern European countries and, and, and kind of uh, the U.S. educational system, because the Italian system is also driven by kind of uh, by the exact sciences and also a, a, a deep respect, if you'd like, for uh, the way education was done at the beginning of the 20th century. Yeah. Um, however, many of the colleagues I had in my bachelor's uh, have completed international schools, right? So uh -huh. the International Baccalaureate Program, the SATs, and mm -hmm. you could see that they were, as you said, pretty good speakers, right? So they knew how to argue points. Uh, probably they wrote hundreds of essays throughout their time in high school. Yeah. I don't think I wrote that many essays, right? I think I did way more maths problems than they did, and physics problems, and computer science. Kind of, uh, I, I wrote a lot more software than they did, but I certainly didn't write as many essays. And you can see all that, because yeah. I always received, uh, as part of feedback from my professors, the fact that, A, Look, your essays are, are very well informed. Like, have all the facts, have all the numbers. But man, is it tough to read. Like, your, and I <laughs> Could you that use that. a metaphor for God's sake? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, uh, and I mean, look, I, I remember this. I, I, I was in I was in the U.S. at Wharton, right? Wharton is, is one of the, the better business schools in the U.S. I'd say, the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia. And I had the privilege of having a professor, which was a former uh, Pulitzer Prize winner. So the Pulitzer oh, wow. Prize is the uh, top prize, I think. In, it's like the, the Oscars for journalists, yes. right? So the guy the guy knew how to write, I think is a fair statement, right? Or and, he knew uh, something about it. Exactly. He knew something about <laughs> it. Right? And the guy was uh, was coaching me as part of this course on, on business writing. And he was, uh, he was offering me a bit of feedback on my essays. And he said, you know, exact same piece of feedback, which was, 
well researched. However, uh, look, you're using too many filler words, and your sentences are five rows long. Like, well, why are you doing that? Like, I'm getting lost in you know, like you, you're not you're not a prose writer, right? You, you you're a business writer. Your your sentences need to be kind of uh, you know straight to the point, pretty short, one or two rows back. And I I have an epiphany, as you said, right? Which is you, you're right. Like, why am I using all of these filler words? Nobody's ever gonna. Like I, I, you don't need that much nuance when you're writing. Just, you need to be very clear, very structured. So I, I, I think that was kind of a turning point. A, a bit late, I feel, but that was a turning point for me. And it was, hey, look, I gotta, I gotta switch up a bit on, on writing anything, not just essays, right? Because day to day you're writing emails, you're writing a slide. It's all of this boring stuff, but it, uh, it, it matters, right? Because it really changes whether your message is well received by the target audience or not. Uh, so now, you know, I kind of moved a bit away from what I was taught in high school, which are these kind of long, winding essays, uh, God knows what of school topic, to all the way to this is what I'm trying to achieve. This is the audience I'm trying to kind of send a message to. These are the top three things I'm trying to communicate. What's the most efficient way for me to write the essay? to hit those three kind of ideas. And this is my, my guiding philosophy for, for writing. Um, and this is just maybe to kind of wrap up my point here. It's just sort of the many mighty school ways that I, I, I tried to move away from what I was taught in high school, at least on the kind of soft skills slash kind of, uh, maybe even language skills side of things, all the way to a mindset in which you're trying to be, you, you're trying to adjust yourself to the new environment you're in, right? Which is kind of a very, from the Western educational system driven environment, at least in, in the business world. I am, uh, I think your system is quite easy to uh, keep in mind and replicate for anyone that's listening to this episode and, and implement. Uh, what, what actually, I, I, I didn't have this strong suit at all. I, I really think it's a living organism. I'm still perfecting it, to be honest with you, but. I'm now obsessed about this. Like yeah, it, it really is a muscle. And to be honest, in executive communication, I'm obsessed with the three to five bullet points. If I and I remember um, in my in, in some of my you know first stints and everything, I was working with entrepreneurs, but the entrepreneurs didn't have the educational background, so they, they their business flourished, but they weren't ready to be executives. So they weren't groomed or had the pedigree over there to be executives. And um, I remember first communicating like this and they wouldn't understand anything because they would want like, you know, follow up questions like why this, why that, get get into details. So I have have developed the poor habit. I consider it poor and detrimental, especially when you work with seasoned executives and with tradition in, in multinationals and, and corporate ladders and corporate communication because I consider it a, a foreign language myself. I, I started writing biblical emails. They were so happy about it. But then again, when I started working with multinationals, these, these guys said they, they were just calling me and said, listen, I don't have the time. Is it something important you, you wrote over there in your email? And they were laughing about it, right? So then I, I, I saw a quote from uh, Blaise Pascal, right? And, and he used to say in a very, as a French philosopher over there and mathematician, he was very funny saying, if I had more time, I would have read, I would have written a shorter letter. So, so then I started, you know, putting more and more time. It took more time, and I, I started looking at, oh my God, I've spent an hour to write five bullet points. But it's quite a technique. People should not underestimate the power of communicating in writing this way with executive boards or or seasoned professionals. So, hearing you put it in a three steps procedure, wish I heard it ten years ago when I, you know, when I was struggling with this, but. Uh, you know, it's it's great that you can share it out there and you can put it in such a uh, in such a simple format. So um, I think it would be a uh, quite you know great at this moment to slide towards the uh, tier one management consulting companies and uh, how do we spot a seasoned professional uh, over there because it uh, I'm not sure if it's sad or if it's odd but these days. Everybody's a consultant or a coach. And in one of my last episodes, we were talking about coaching, professional, certified, international coaching. And, you know, there, there are certain procedures. There's a school. There are accreditations. But 
if, if I could not see, but only hear someone that has been in a top 10 management consulting firm, I, I would knew that they, you know, they have it in their blood. So there are a couple of ways to spot these uh, professional consultants. And I would like to explore with you, please, well, what would be your uh, Hawthorne over there with, with which you would look for, for this kind of guy or gal? So I think there's so many types of consultants out there, as you said. Now, everybody's a consultant nowadays. And I think probably that's why consultants also get a bad reputation. Mm -hmm. uh, so I want to start and preface that by kind of describing a bit what what a consultant does, yeah. and what the various types of consultants uh, are out there, right? So a consultant, what, at least in the kind of professional sense, um, when you're thinking of strategy or management consultants, what you're really thinking of is some tools uh, which can kind of be parachuted inside an organization and focus on a problem with surgical precision. Um, and I know I'm being a bit vague here. No, 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 please. Because at the end of the day, there are so many problems that you could be deployed to solve. So you could look at uh, optimizing a supply chain. You could look at perfecting a marketing strategy. Uh, you might want to find a way to grow the business, you know, either by growing revenue or by improving pricing. So there are so, so many problems. Now, you might ask yourself as an organization or as a manager inside an organization, why couldn't I do that myself? And the, the quick reality here is you could. Quite frankly, any of these things are probably something you can execute on. The question is, do you have the right amount of resources? And expertise and do you have the time to execute on that and do you are you willing to take on the risk of execution right so these are three things which you need to have in mind when executing on your software and i would argue that if you're a big enough organization you might lack in one of these three things uh, in many cases and that, that's why you might want to kind of have a team of consultants jump in so let's say you want to do pricing strategy uh, you could hire a pricing professional who's an expert in the field it might take you four or six months to hire ahead of pricing, right? But your margins are declining today, right? Um, so you're bleeding. Example, Basically, what you're saying, sorry for the for bracket, yeah. you're bleeding. You're bleeding. You're bleeding and you don't have time. Uh, and also, when you're hiring a new pricing professional, it takes them time to ramp up, right? Like, it's, it's not something you can just kind of change straight away. It's not a plug and play. Point. Exactly. So it's definitely not a plug and play. Um, and, and the more complex the topic is, the more ramp up time and time to hire you have. So that's why when, when you have consultants jumping in, you need to consider, um, hey, look, these guys have seen probably uh, not one, not 10, but probably hundreds of, of examples of, of pricing strategies in the market. And while you might, you, you might see, let's say you hire a consultant from day one, you might see a fresh kind of 23 year old face join you in the office, um, it doesn't mean that that person isn't backed up by a team of partners which have seen you know, combined hundreds or thousands of cases uh, in, in the industry of pricing strategies, right? And they definitely couldn't form that kind of fresh 23-year-old face. And that, that person there is just to kind of collect information, understand the wider picture, and then take on the recommendations of people much more expertise than them, and then implement them on their behalf, right? So it's it's not because uh, you, you probably hear this this uh, expression or uh, a proverb a lot of times, which is consultants will kind of uh, steal your watch and then tell you the time. Uh, and of course, it's true to an extent in the sense that we use the data inside your organization, which is already out there. The question is, what you make out of the data, and probably this is where consultants bring all the value add. So I, I, I know it's kind of, it's a bit of a winding road versus your initial question of how do you spot No, yourself? no, no, not necessarily. For me, it made a lot of sense. I'm just uh, thinking of taking what you have given me and maybe even streamline it more or strip it more to the bone. Um, what comes in mind, if I may uh, help over here, is people should envision a management consultant like someone that is really savvy and you'll feel him or her that they're savvy it's just going to be it, you're going to need three minutes to know that they're savvy and in, uh, in the industry or the matter that you're approaching them and uh, 
I guess it depends, depends on the age, right? Because you, so you've got people who are partners in the solid firms. And again, they've seen so many kind of projects. They're probably, they're, I think it's safe to say they have more expertise than the head of pricing for a top firm. Yeah. Kind of taking an example of pricing, right? Because they've just seen so much. And here you have like a six month project starting to the next one. Um, if it's a younger consultant, they might not have an expertise, right? Because again, they're just out of school. However, they, but they have, have the process. Uh, they have a process and they have a set of skills which people in the industry might not possess to the same extent. And probably I'm, I'm, my feeling is that's what you want to deep dive into here, right? Yeah, I think you've created a perfect segue for me, thanks. Um, what, I, what I wanted to, uh, to go towards was that if, if we're talking about, so, so of course, plethora of experience backed by process and mental capacity is a great combo. But, but even, you know, uh, so, so let's talk a bit about seasoned consultants, right? I see seasoned consultants as someone who can hear your thoughts, can hear what you're not saying, can read between the lines, can see the forest because of the trees. That's an, that, that comes from experience. So that's their advantage. Number two, and this is something even juniors will be able to do them, or, or let's say mid-experience, and this is because of the blessing of the process and the, the grunt process they've been through to actually become who they are, um, is the ability to break anything into pieces and mold them. So if you give them like a large chunk of data, they will be able, without knowing very much of, of that industry, to break it down into pieces and make it the shape they need so that they go to step three, which is building the visual representation of where that client wants to be or can be. So, so that would be, you know, my, my way of, uh, of um, you know, stripping to the bone what you have just mentioned. And I hope it's, uh, it's a pretty uh, accurate one. No, for sure. Look, I, I, I love the way you kind of presented that. L let me uh, add a qualifier there, which is Please. across this, these three or four steps you've mentioned, and every single time you are in a constant feedback with the client. So you take the data, you break it down, you drive some conclusions. But remember, you, at least as a junior, you definitely haven't seen as much of the industry as, as a person on the opposite side of the barricade. So it's, it's important to know that whatever conclusions you're drawing, you're in a constant kind of, uh, process of communicating with the client to understand, hey, look, uh, this is what I discovered. Is this something you already knew? Or is, is this something insightful? If it is something insightful, what are the next steps you could take based on this data? Because chances are, if I'm presenting you with the data, you know better what to do with it. I'm just the person who furnishes you the right data and what I think is insightful, right? And this way, you as a consultant also start to build up a bit of that learning curve, right? So you you ask yourself certain... Let, let me give you a concrete example here, right? So I'll, I'll take my projects. So... I was uh, I was in a pretty pretty technical kind of uh, project, an investment due diligence on a firm that was doing insurance services. Uh -huh. Insurance is uh, it's a tough field, right? Like there's so many terms. It's a foreign language. It's it's a foreign language for for people outside of that world, and I was definitely an outsider. Right? So now uh, you, you start kind of unraveling a bit what different types of of insurance are so you've got defined contribution right so all of these things <laughs> these are terms you need to start learning on yeah day one like not even week one but day one right our one uh, our one our right? one so you yeah. start reading through the background of the case but no the thing is you you learn the terms as a consultant does that mean you actually know how the industry works definitely not you just yeah. learn the dictionary that, that's never going to get you there so you start you need to start understanding uh where to kind of use these concepts and which of these concepts are actually worth using in this case and what might prove insightful in this case, right? So that's why you kind of need to start working with the client to understand, hey, look, uh, you've got this piece of data. So in, in, in my specific case, I noticed that uh, they had a very high turnover, uh, the, the insurance firm, in terms of their salespeople, uh, way more than any other industry that I've seen so far. And I'm like, mm -hmm. hey, this doesn't look right. Like you, you guys need to start to doing something about it, uh, because obviously I'm I'm coming in with the outside perspective. Yeah, and the client tells me, "What really? We we have some of the best churn rates in the industry, right? Because it's all relative. So 15 percent or 20 percent churn per year 
is not something unheard of, turns out, yeah. for, for insurance salespeople. Because at the end of the day, it's, it's a tough business, right? Selling insurance, hmm, like uh, only, only the successful ones will survive, and, and the rest will just churn, right? So that's why what I'm saying is you you have kind of this uh, this muscle of being able to look through data, sift through uh, a, a lot of potential insights in such a short amount of time, but it's important to always have this extra kind of support from the client in the back of your mind and, and try to put yourself in their shoes, not just work in silence. Right? So I, I think that's, that's something worth mentioning here. And I think we have to be careful with the superpower because it happened to me so many times looking around while I was at dinner or in my holiday of potential that's being wasted or money that's being lost. In that business, oh, yeah. although I was in holiday or <laughs> I was out, I was out for dinner, right? Because your mind keeps on going once you go in that. Uh, I, I think I must admit I am I am dependent of these calculus. I enjoy them very much. Um, for me, it's like making a a puzzle. Uh, it's like you know it, I, I no longer associate them with work. So it's like a, it's it's like a leisure uh, hobby. But as you mentioned, this really has to be a, a strong suit. The uh, accelerated learning path with respect to terminology, understanding how the terminology connects with the business, how it impacts, especially where, you know, my profit has, has, has gone down with 20%. What do we do? You, you get a two-liner. Uh, yeah, you, uh, yeah, you have to start the but, surgery, as you said, right? You've used this word. The, the shortest questions are, are the toughest to answer. Right, because there are just so many ways to kind of tackle it. So, uh, and and, yeah. by, and by the way, just to close this with a very funny, uh, with a funny, I hope funny for those working in management consulting in general. By the moment you realize what the keywords are, uh, key terms in assurance, you find out that the insurer is reassured, and that's backfiring the price and profitability. So, <laughs> so <laughs> just when you thought you thought that you know you know uh, everything uh, over there, so. Are there any other qualities? I think we, we also should spend some time on talking about the, the liaison capability and, you know, the client exposure phase, right? Because um, um, I think it was Victor Chang that said this. We have to give the man credit that in order to be a good consultant, you, don't ha you have to avoid, avoid being an asshole. <laughs> Right? I like that. Okay. Yeah. So um, I think the uh, what what of course in in in, in let's say in, in lighter terms I think he was trying to point out that you really should not seem as condescending when talking with a client or as patronizing them right which is quite sensible because there could be problems over there that they're very sensitive to touch and feel upon so what about this set of skills of you know balancing your speech and your presentation and 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 um, tailoring your message according to audience. Let's put it that way. I mean, look, in, in consulting, you're never going to be the smartest person. I think, let, let me start by saying that. And because of that, you need to learn, and you will learn, I think, humility of that. Because uh, chances are you're thrown, you're being parachuted into a new industry, new firm. Um, it takes you a week just to kind of understand the fundamentals. Uh, so, so you need, as you've said, to strike a very fine balance between uh, being confident with whatever you communicate. And, and that's crucial because remember, not everyone at your client's side is a friend. Some are actually foes, some are people who will doubt whatever you say. Yeah. So you need to be confident because otherwise, essentially, you're not trusted, right? Yeah. So that, that's one part of the equation. But then you need to make sure that uh, you, you are humble in the sense that whatever recommendations you are pushing will be iterated a lot, a lot of times, just to add maybe an extra set of nuance, uh, just to add a bit more granularity, just to detail a bit further to make sure it's actually optimized. Because at the end of the day, um, I, I think the price tag for a consulting team is high. So the, the quality of the work needs to be up there. Mm -hmm. And quality of the work also means at the end of the day, making sure that you've kind of extinguished all avenues in terms of tapping that problem, right? So, Absolutely. so it's a, just kind of summing that up. It's it's a very fine balance between uh, speaking with confidence, with authority, being structured, being a very good communicator on the one hand. Mm -hmm. Then on the other hand, being open to feedback, being a good listener, 
Yeah. So potentially, even if you're leading the presentation, you might want to actually spend more time hearing out questions and concerns and feedback uh, versus you just rattling off a set of slides, right? Yeah. So it, it, it's a fine it's a fine line to strike between these two. Of course, we just pointed out over here some of the top qualities that you know will make someone stand out as a as a top tier consultant. They might seem as being uh, you know quite easy to fill on a sticky note, but guys, just want to point out that these might be skills you need to train for ten to fifteen years until you excel at them. And even then, you're gonna excel temporary because it's a living organism, a working progress, something you'll constantly need to sharpen as a saw. Thanks for uh, sharing some of your uh, experiences over here, um, Mate. And uh, I think our sniper is pretty calibered over here with respect to what we would have as an expectation when we hire someone and throw them in our ocean of problems waiting for um, solutions. So but not that I want to point out that I'm somehow uh, biased by the idea of consultants or the... Uh, affinity that I have for this profession, but I do see them as Navy, Navy SEAL agents really prepared to face any enemy that is out there, or at least, you know, be able to uh, provide a fight battle if they're not going to win it. That, that, that's actually quite funny because uh, consulting firms love, for some reason, army personnel, kind of hiring former officers. So, I mean, perhaps less so in Europe, but in, in the US, I've seen a good number of cases of uh, former, you know, officers or surgeons in the U.S. Army do an yeah. MBA and then join a consulting firm. So even, even in BCG uh, in the Middle East, well, I mean, perhaps the Middle East is particularly well suited for that. But I've seen a good number of people who actually were you know, working in the army before joining join BCG, uh, which is interesting, right? It's quite funny yeah. because you, you, you wouldn't expect that. Um, but it, it happens, and I, I can see I can see how some skills are very transferable. Yeah. Right. So discipline, right? That, that's a big, big one. Um, I think it, it also takes a bit of uh, perhaps uh, maybe one, one muscle you want to train is definitely kind of flexibility in terms of approach, because that that's a big one in consulting, and maybe that's one thing people from more standard backgrounds, not, not only the army, right, but maybe the corporate yeah. need to train when, when joining consulting, let's say post MBA. So if you're, a, if you're an experienced professional, there are some, you, you are coming with a set of skills, which is probably expertise, which is being able to follow through the implementation, but then there are some other skills you want to train. Um, and you just need to be mindful of that, right, when we're jumping into consulting from, from the industry. Yeah, and, um, you know, I think in general, we're looking at a bodybuilder that can stretch like a gymnast. So it, yeah, it might yeah. seem easy, but it's not that hard, especially if you're bulking up with muscles, which represent the knowledge in our metaphor over here, so that your Pulitzer professor is proud of the metaphors we're using, right? <laughs> not talking with A plus B equals C uh, in that kind of way. What's your most important takeaway from Boston Consulting Group uh, management consulting uh, experience? Let's see the top three valuable lessons you walked out with after two and a half years. Um, closer to two, by the way, mm -hmm. but um, in, in consulting overall. But let, 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 let me let me think about this. Um, I would say the number one, and it takes me a second because there's so much. Right? No, 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 no problem, no problem. <laughs> All of it, but probably the number one is uh, the fact that whatever idea you're trying to communicate across. I think it's 30% content and 70% format or delivery in terms of ensuring <laughs> that that idea is well received by the other part. And why am I saying that? Because I think every single day, uh, you need to kind of debate your ideas with other people. And you need to persuade that probably your idea, or your way of thinking is probably better than somebody else's, right? So persuasion is, is a daily activity. Really. It's, it's such an understated skill. And persuasion is absolutely an integral part of consulting. And I think it's a very well-trained muscle in consulting. Um, and the reason for that is because the content of your idea is, is very important, but also if you're not kind of attentive to the way you deliver it, and what I'm saying deliver it, it comes in many forms, right? Yeah. 
So it could be visually, it could be in terms of the structure, in terms of how much time you take to kind of deliver. Uh, as long as delivery is right, you might err a bit on the content side, but that's fine, right? Mm -hmm. So delivery being out there with content, I think, is the, my number one takeaway, right? Yeah. In my time of consulting. Um, a second takeaway is that um, I think the world is underestimating a bit, particularly when when, when dealing with uh, kind of large decisions, is underestimating a bit the idea of being able to provide a, a good idea, um, or rather a good insight fast, mm -hmm. right? So be, being uh, parsimonious in a sense. And here I'm kind of hinting at the 80-20 rule, right? Yeah. So the idea is, how do you spend the least amount of time to come up with a very good recommendation? So what the 80-20 rule says here is you want to spend 20% of the time you could spend, right? To get 80% of the insight, as opposed to kind of going 100% on, on both ends, right? And just, being being able to kind of be 80-20 here is, is another statement of skill, not only consulting, but in many other industries, right? Basically, I, I think, sorry to, to barge in like this, but... I think there people have a different view of the 80-20 rule. And I just want to clarify what you just mentioned over here to simplify it. Basically, guys, you don't have the 80 in consulting. Okay, so it's not the classic 80-20 rule. Is you only have 20% because you have minimum time to understand the vast complexity of the problem and deliver the That's solution. Right. You don't have the 80-20 the doesn't, so it's not the classic 80-20 because you don't have the 80%. But in 20%, you need to understand 80%. That's why we call it the 80-20. Uh, Mateo, is there a fair way to uh, explain this uh, in a more tailored way for consulting? Absolutely. I love that. So 20% is the amount of time you can spend relative. And let's say 100% is the exhaustive kind of yeah, correct. Uh, biblical essay. Biblical essay <laughs> correct. Useful, right? uh, 20% is the time. 80% is the amount of, let's say, insight or the amount of complexity you can tap into. Right. Correct. When again, 100% is like full understanding of the issue. So be, being able to be 80, 20, again, in life, not only yeah, in, in mean, life, not only yeah. your kind of professional activity, I think that's key. So if, if you're going to the gym, of course, you can go full of 100% in terms of your dedication. But probably you don't have the time, right? So the question is, how do I make the best of my time in the gym? How do I make the best of my time playing tennis? Exactly. Right? How do I make the best of my time by reading a book? I think that's something that would be great to, to start looking into, not only in professional endeavors, but also outside of that, because at the end of the day, we have limited time, right? The way Absolutely. You spend it is the way you, know, you, you can improve yourself as a person, right? So I, I'm trying to do that 80 20 across also other aspects of my life. Right? Also, like, hey, health, diet. Let's take diet as an example. I love hamburgers. <laughs> there will be a 20% of hamburgers that I, I cannot live without them, right? Uh, the other 80%, sure. Uh, veggies, uh, low sugars, but I, I beat the 20%. So uh, maybe this is, this is a bit of a stretch in terms of the metaphor. But uh, my point here is just make sure that um, you're not boiling the ocean. Another yeah. phrase that the consultants love, right? Uh, Absolutely. And I'm sure, and I'm sure in, in, in some professions it's, it's inevitable, right? So I'm sure if you're an engineer, uh, and you're building a bridge, hell, I mean, boil that ocean because <laughs> lives are on the line. Uh, but you, you don't have the luxury in your consulting, right? And I think you need to be mindful of that by being better for some. Um, I think I only, I only gave you two out of three, right? So yeah, of, yeah, I was uh, waiting for the third one, but yeah, no problem yeah, but because it, it was very, uh, you know, it was very important for us to explain this 80 20 concept so that people understand where the pressure is coming from in consulting okay so thanks yep. for drilling into it because that that's equaling pressure right so um let's go to the third one yeah just a final copy out there which is pressure comes from many sources of consulting. so time yeah of course must, must be the biggest one a uh, lack of information probably is another source of pressure right so and frustration complete visibility <laughs> frustration is yeah I, I it's like breakfast it's, it's breakfast <laughs> <laughs> uh, also, trust is, is another place where 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 pressure is coming from. Mm -hmm. Do do clients trust you? Uh, does your manager in consulting trust whatever the hell you put on the slide? Right. So this is uh, so. Uh, 
the, the last one is is uh, it's a bit of a vexing one for myself, but it, 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 it relates to interestingly enough to dealing with pressure, right? So uh, let me come in detail about working hours alone. Stress is at very high levels in prison. The question is, uh, how do you train yourself to start battling against these kind of factors? And the way you do that is you, you see it as a marathon and not as a sprint. And when I say it, I'm referring to, referring, I guess, to a professional world, right? Yeah. And, I, I, you know, hell, first three, four months in consulting were, were very tough, right? Working hours were tough, stress was tough. But then by the time I reached, I think my first year, my first and a half year, I started realizing, hey, first of all, I enjoy what I'm doing, right? Because I enjoy what I'm doing, I actually start not being able to deep dive into whatever I'm doing and see results when I get, get up there, even if it means long, working longer hours, even if it means a lot of time pressure from my boss or from my client. And it's just a shift in mindset that I managed to achieve into thinking, when you know when is the weekend coming all the way to you know what by the end of this week i want to make sure that i deliver this right and i want to make sure i do it the best i can even if it means working longer hours and let me also say something interesting which is i i hear i mean, I, I hear this particularly in a lot in romania less less so in the uk or the us but it's, it's probably very which is um whenever you work hard you hear the idea of Hey, you you kind of a, a, a how, how should I put it? Um, I, I think there's a word in Romanian, but you kind of a corporate speak of sorts, right? Um, corporatist is, is the word I'm. Yeah, I'm yeah, sure. corporate geek. I think it's like corporate uh, geek. Yeah. is kind of the, the right translation here. And I, I hate that because, yeah, of course, like you kind of dedicated a, a lot of hours to maybe something that's not your own business, which is not your own endeavor. But I want to dispel the idea that. You can't do that just because somebody else is kind of reaping the results of your work. I think as long as you dedicate, as as long as you, you have the right environment and the right set of kind of problems that you can tackle, and uh, uh, let's say an achievement can work towards, I think you can definitely dedicate the time. Right. So maybe my third takeaway here is kind of sum it up and stop going in all directions. Um, train yourself. When you want to kind of hit a certain target, to think in terms of running a marathon and understand that you need to relish whatever you're doing and you need to change your mindset towards um, towards an approach in which, hey, look, I love what I'm doing. Um, I can develop skills in the way to doing that. And very importantly, I will love the moment I deliver whatever I want to do. Right? So once you achieve that mindset change, I think you're so much better primed to actually work the consulting hours or work long hours in whatever you do. It could be your own business. Right? So I think it's this mindset change that is a big takeaway. I really believe that people should, I mean, passionate folks that are able to deep dive and, and, and get this level of dopamine from their job, career, mission, should completely ignore those that are questioning them as being corporate geeks and the perfect reply for that would be, and this is very sad, and I've asked this question very often, what are you passionate about? And they wouldn't be able to give you an answer except from some culinary dishes or a few wines. If you can answer differently to this question, my friend, you're one step closer to happiness, and I'm glad you found your vocation. Thanks for sharing your uh, top three list over there. Um, I think. Now we should take a step back and reflect a bit of what have we learned so far uh, from the current recession and then move towards a bit more history and think of the pandemic. I mean, like, um, I guess by recession you're referring to what has been happening, I guess, in the last... Yeah, the last one and a half year, yeah. You know, cost of finance itself, inflation, uh, you know, uh, job losses, redundancies, AI revolution, kind of this period. You, you're right. I mean, there's so many kind of conflicting factors that come into play here. Um, so it's, again, very important to recognize the, the context that we're in because you, 
you essentially are looking at probably a full decade of full-on economic growth, only from 2012, 2013, all the way to the pandemic. Um, it's important to recognize that unemployment was slowly going down, like right up until the pandemic. And then suddenly you're faced with this kind of one-off events that that's pretty much a black swan, right? Nobody could have put it through. And in terms of the, the pure kind of financial and economic implications, uh, never have you ever seen probably in the, almost in history uh, 20% of the workforce being suddenly out in a matter of a month, right? So I, I, I'm sure economists were puzzled to say the least by the pandemic and, and its effect. And then it's interesting to see what happened right afterwards because you have, you know, you have central banks pushing in so much money into the economy. Um, and then, uh, you know, if, if you're looking all the way to today, then inflation becomes inevitable, right? So it's, uh, we shouldn't be surprised by where, where we ended up in the last one and a half years. What surprises me, at least, is uh, the fact that so far it looks like a soft landing, right? So this is, this is not 2008, or at least it doesn't look... You know, you know why I, I sorry to interrupt here, but you know why I think it's not 2008? It's because we went through 2008. That's why it's not 2008. So we've become more familiar and uh, the, the skin got thicker with us living within crisis. But that doesn't mean it's not pre a pretty heavy storm just because your house is pretty solid. This is my point of view. Fully agree, but I think it's, 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 it's a bit more complex because Again, the context about this uh, small, I'm not, should I call it, it's, it's, definitely, it's definitely not a depression. It, it, it's a technical recession, isn't it? Because at the end of the day, I think you have a couple of quarters of lower low economic growth in the US. I think the UK just said they had negative growth in Q4. So it's a technical recession, but it doesn't really feel like a full on kind of 2008 threat. And when I'm saying that, what I'm really saying is the magnitudes of the lack of economic growth is not as high, which is which is good because I think it could have gone bad in so many so many ways. So I, probably you're familiar with the term stagflation, right? So stagflation happens when you have low inflation and low economic growth. It's a conundrum because how as yeah. an economist, how can you solve both at the same time? You cannot. And probably what you want to do is you first want to solve inflation. You kill one. Economic. Exactly. You kill one, but at the expense of the other. Yep. So that's why it's such a big problem, because if you have high inflation, you need to kill it by pushing up interest rates. Pushing up interest rates also means low economic growth, because people spend less, they buy less, fewer houses, right? So that, in theory, should push you towards even slower economic growth. I don't think that happens to the same extent today as other kind of famous stagflation mm -hmm. crises in the modern history, right? So think of 1973 and then more than so I, I guess what I'm trying to push through a bit is a sense of cautious optimism. Mm -hmm. um, it's hard to say, but I feel like we might be past the storm. So I think we, we went through the eye of the storm. We just might be, I think, entering, or we, we might be exiting from the other kind of side of the storm. Uh, but don't quote me on this because you know inflation is still around. Economic growth hasn't ramped up. I'm not sure what, what jobs are doing in the US, but I, I don't think they're at kind of historical lows either. And you've got so many, by the way, on, on the kind of geopolitical side of things. You have so many other events. I way was way. just thinking that I think the, the, the metaphor we should use here is black swans. Because I, yeah, exactly. I rarely have seen in the past 50 years such a mixture of... of uh, problematic events from um, war-driven inflation to economic-driven inflation to um, lack of cash to a technological revolution re leading oh, to yeah. redundancies which are masked under the perfect excuse that there's a crisis and so on and so forth. So this is quite like uh, from every angle you look you have a vulnerability but uh, at the end of the day I guess I'm not that scared of AI considering what a management consultant still has to do like the Navy SEAL as opposed to the lawyers or uh, I would say the bankers or the fiscal and accounting consultants which are more vulnerable out there. So this cautious uh, optimism uh, that, that, that you mentioned. 
Do you wanna do you wanna open up the the AI's Pandora's box? Oh, we can, we can delve into that. So yeah, about it. Okay. yeah, I, I I know everybody's talking about it. Uh, let's let's get your your insight over here, especially and and then I'm touching this especially because you're coming from a tangible product. Let's call it that way, right? Oh yeah. yeah. Migrating towards a digital product which would be the app itself so yeah let's let's deep dive into this so i think as you're you're mentioning ai in the context of, of the wider context of economics uh, let, let me let me kind of first offer my view on the, the wider please please here. i think we're at the we're at the very kind of tail end of that or tail beginning rather in the sense that it's everybody's talking about it it's it's definitely ai has so much potential in terms of kind of Changing the ways we, we work, uh, shifting entire industries to towards kind of an automated model. However, today I don't think that is happening just yet. So we're at the very beginning of this revolution. People are are looking at mentioning the ways it will affect us, but right now I don't think if you look at the wide economy, the the effects are are the, the effects are understated today, right? Now the question is. How will this impact us in 10, 15 years? I think this is what we really want to ask ourselves. So today, today, the impact is a lot um, And definitely, industries will change, right? I think you you know the kind of famous saying of well, if you go back in 1970 and you tell people that social media manager will be a job in a couple of decades. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're going to... <laughs> they're... So that's why I think, same for us today, if we're trying to exercise understanding how AI will shape mm -hmm. jobs in various industries, it's, it's, a, it's a tough exercise because you don't really know. Mm -hmm. No, it's clear that some jobs will, will, will go away, right? So truck drivers is a, is a famous one, right? The question for me becomes, and the conundrum is, what you do with these jobs? Can you... Uh, universal basic income is, is one answer that I'm, I'm hearing. Right? Uh, question is, uh, do people that are actually out of a job, can they be just as productive? Right? Can they can they change the set of skills as easy? Now, I think these are the major questions economists and politicians need to solve over the, the next 10 to 15 years. And it's it's uh, I mean we can be all optimistic about AI, but it's it's a tough one to solve, right? It's a tough one to understand, first of all, which which direction is AI going towards, how how it should be regulated, and also for all of these kind of macroeconomic changes, uh, what's the right answer? Because it's always it's always a trade-off. If you're offering universal basic income. What you're really saying is using tax dollars, right, from working people to potentially fund unemployed people. So that's a conundrum. Do you want to do that? Another way to see things is, um, is it even worth actually giving up such jobs when, in fact, the, the, the extra kind of increment towards the economy that you win from automated certain services is more than offset by leaving so many people unemployed. So major, major of economic issues that will have to be tackled over the next 10, 15 years. I don't think there's the right answer. I don't think today we can talk about the right answers unless we start kind of hitting these effects of AI displacement on a wider scale. Right? Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if BBC or CNB, uh, C CNCB or um, uh, you know um, uh, CNN would actually ask us to discuss in one of the shows because what you have touched upon over here is the elephant in the room which everybody is uh, ignoring. Um, I'm, not, I'm not confident at all that any of the politicians will solve this uh, or any the, of the economists because some, something that economists miss is, is that goes, people are not rational. People cannot take isolated decisions in an ideal world and they react and they're sentimental and they refuse and they... Uh, they are grumpy and uh, they they hold a grudge and so on and so forth. So that's something you cannot really project in your numbers with a, lo a lot of accuracy. It is my po personal opinion that AI will be of the survival of the fittest, as it was in many other revolutions with the folks. And you know, the, the stronger thrived, uh, grew and raised, and the other just have have fallen behind. And and in fact, this is how if we look at mythology and we look at the early days, this is how the world has always been. But it's very interesting to to for you to actually uh, paint such a macro picture in which 
everything is tied to an opportunity cost and i'm not sure oh, yeah. i'm not sure where does the buck stop 10 to 15 years from now so uh, you know it, it, i i kind of consider it creepy as a topic as as we deep dive into it because I'm thinking that people underestimate the social and economic impact of this uh, black swan that we have among our pond as we speak. Um, well, one interesting point that you made, well, I'm touching on that, is um, it will for sure, I believe, lead to economic concentration, right? What does that mean? So, AI tech probably is being developed by three, four, five major firms today, right? Yeah. Uh, you can imagine that as AI becomes more and more indispensable, uh, whole industries, not just companies, are reliant on the providers of technology. So that, that inevitably leads to economic concentration, just in terms of you know, what, what countries, first of all, and which, which firms have control current industries, but also, I'm sure, wealth concentration. Right? So these are two very tangible kind of economic conundrums that we will face, and I'm sure of that. And by the way, you're seeing that you're seeing that wealth concentration happen even at the kind of the, the dawn of the dot com age, right? Absolutely. So that, that that's already been happening in, in, in various industries for I'm sure decades. But it has to be the case that it will only accelerate. Right. So this is this is one of the most tangible maybe items that we as a society I think we can solve, right? Um, but yeah, I think I think that that's kind of my view of the higher level impacts of AI. Now, I'm kind of happy happy to kind of, maybe if you want to do that, delve into what it means for us, I guess, in business. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm curious to see what are your, you know, um, let's say initial stages with implementing this and how are you integrating this uh, for uh, Blue Ground? And especially you are on the verge of becoming a digital product, right? Um, yeah. Um, and, and, and when I say becoming, it's not that you're not there yet. It's just that you have a roadmap for where you, where you consider, the, you know, the final stages and you keep working on that, right? So how are you guys dealing, integrating this, managing this, uh, you know, uh, adding this in your menu? Yes, I mean, you, you, you're very right there by saying that Blue Ground is a, is a very palatable product. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's it's not as it's less digital than, than other competitors in the space, but definitely the, the operational side of things is it's you know it's just more crucial I guess than, mm -hmm. than for other kind of fully digital businesses. Um, so then, of course, it, it's not to say that you don't have long cushions for implementing AI this year. So um, one key example I'd like to mention here in terms of how we're doing AI is we have so much data behind the scenes, right? So we are collecting so much data regarding our operations, regarding the kind of type of marketing we're doing, what works, what doesn't, uh, regarding the price that we're kind of selling the units for. Um, so much data behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. Now the question is, what you make out of the data? Almost like a classical consulting issue. Yeah. Um, and answer is, let's use AI, right? Before you do that, though, I think it's worth clarifying what, what does the AI actually mean, right? So I, I did my, my master's in analytics, and I was lucky, so I think about five years ago, to actually stumble upon an optional course in machine learning. So machine learning is the more technical term for AI at the end of the day, right? And I think it's worth kind of, just to keep it very simple, it's worth differentiating between two types of AI that are out there. Mm -hmm. today, right? One is the, the type of AI, machine learning, that deals with numbers. Yep. So that's the type of, of AI or machine learning algorithms that kind of feed or are being fed numbers, right? So that could be prices, that could be dates, um, that could be whatever you can think of in terms of numbers and, and kind of outputs or spits out a number. So let me give you an example. Uh, you want to develop the best price that you're going to sell your partner for, right? Uh, you need to be aware of many things, right? So the location of the apartment, the season of the year, uh, probably how much uh, supplies in the market. All these things, you can kind of turn them into a number, right? So you can develop a machine learning algorithm that spits out a number, which tells you, hey, listen, this is the optimal price you want to sell your apartment for. Basically right. like a quant analyst. You're, you know, your exactly. super speed of light quant analyst for anything yeah. you want to put a price on. 
and you want to do that, then there's not only prices. So any 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 number you can kind of fill. Or yeah, or or years, or or anything or that the exactly. answer is in number, you have exactly. your your genie over there, your quant genie. And and then there are so many algorithms here, and fundamentally these these have been around for a while, the better parts of a decade. Or, or you can even argue. I mean, this is this is just pure statistics, right? These have been around for maybe 30, 40, 50 years. So nothing new here recently, um, or nothing major, right? Um, however, uh, people are kind of confounding the two because they see the recent advancements in linguistics AI, which is the mm -hmm. second category, and they kind of confound both as being kind of the, the, the major through groups of recent events. But but in, in actuality, machine learning, numbers driven by machine learning AI has been around for so long, right? The, the true revolution that we're seeing or we've seen since ChatGPT is um, so let's say the, the logical processing or the text processing side of things, right? So up until recently, if you could use an AI algorithm to spit out the, the optimal price, you didn't really have the, the right equivalent uh -huh. on, on the verbal side of things, which is to take unstructured text. Um, could be essays, could be books, could be newspaper articles, anything that has text as the basis of the movement and spit out the output. And you, you can imagine how that's so much tougher. Right, because let's say you want to open the price. Let's say in the market, the nightly price of an apartment is between 100 and 500 US dollars, right? So it's really just offering a number between 100 and 500. That's that's the, the task of the, of the numbers you're measuring on. <laughs> on the tech side, there are so many possibilities, right? Like there's no right answer in actuality. So you can so see how, how much more complex uh, the issue is. Yeah, I, I, I think I, you know, I'm, I'm having an epiphany again here because, you know, I'm working myself with Copilot or ChatGPT or however. I really believe you have to be an expert to know how to work with this tool. And it can, you know, uh, judging by the fact that there's so much biased information over there to be collected. Because we can make, let, let's give, let me give you another example. We can make a video about what a management consultant is and put out a wrong conclusion out there a totally biased conclusion we post it on youtube it will be you know one day visualized over there and they will draw the summary and this will mix with another accurate uh definition and it will be diluted and eventually the essence will be lost so unless you're an expert and know how to identify the the, the core essence of what you're looking it can be also a tool that it will totally misguide you so i don't know who will be oh, the sure. riff yeah, I don't know who will be the referee for that uh, <clears throat> one day, but definitely, as you're saying, it's in a stage in which is bulking up, soaking information, and uh, you still need to point it in the right direction to actually make out something of it. So I think expert, expert is an interesting word because the, the chat GPT and equivalent models, right, which are called by way of LLMs, also mm -hmm. uh, large language models, in, in their current form, they've been around. I think the, the first academic article which introduced them, I think, was in 2018. Um, right? So I, they've been around in the academic setting for what, five, six years? And in the practical context, well, quite frankly, since ChatGPT. So they've been around for, frankly, two, three years. So to call somebody an expert is maybe a bit misguided, but we we're actually discovering how these models really work. Right? Yeah. Well, so that, that's why, an expert, however, let, let me point out, there's a new job, which is called prompt engineer, right? Which is just uh, a, an engineer with, uh, which knows how to communicate with these models, which is very interesting, right? It's like we've created something. It's a foreign language. Really know, it's a foreign language, exactly. We don't really know how to speak with it. But there are people who start kind of understanding the way it works, the way it thinks through these models, and start optimizing what we're feeding them in terms of prompts. To get to these are uh, it's very young kind of perspective. It's it's very young, first of all, right? So if you think of LLMs, large language models, which is what essentially ChatGPT and all of the other kind of recent advancements are, are based on, they they exist in the academic context. They have existed for about five or six years. So since twenty eighteen, I think the the first uh, the first. Academic paper that looked at this uh, was called "Attention is All You Need." So this is what started. Then I, I I haven't seen it too often kind of represented, but it's very interesting. And actually, there is one academic paper which started this entire revolution. It's called "Attention is All You Need." I think people need to talk that 
about about that a bit more. So it was super super interesting. So, and then it appeared, by the way, sometime in 2018. So again, academic context that's kind of five years, and then the actual kind of practical business context has been around for what I guess since ChatGPT more set scale. So that's 10, 10, 22, one and a half years, let's say. Mm -hmm. So you really need to think of what does an expert actually need in this context, and I. I I think it's it's a bit tricky because right now we're still trying to understand what LLMs actually output and how they think and how they process information. And it's it's not always uh, straightforward because it, it's a black box at the end of the day. So there's millions, billions, right, of, uh, of kind of these little neurons, if you'd like, as part of these models. And each of them acts in its own kind of trained way. But it's, it's very hard to kind of assess effects of scale. So that's why you've got this new job, which is called prompt engineering which is almost like speaking a new language, right? Super interesting to, to kind of understand from their perspective, okay, how, how can I train the model in such a way that it actually optimizes what I'm trying to achieve? Um, so super interesting to, to see this happen. But getting back to your initial question, how do we move around actually use AI? Again, super, super kind of, if you'd like, or we're not, it's, it's more conventional product in a sense. Right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Not fully digital. Uh, one thing we've identified, which is very interesting, we're trying to make sense of all the Latin, Latin data that ex exists there, right? Whether it's pricing data, whether it's operational data. One thing we managed to do is we managed to train a, a chatbot, which essentially allows various teams inside your organization uh, carry out pretty complex data analysis mm -hmm. by just essentially voicing over what they want to uncover from the data. So I'll give you an example. Mm -hmm. Let's say I want to understand the pricing performance of all of the units that are you know, two-bedroom apartments in this very specific area of the city over the last three months. So normally, if you want to get that data, there's two things, or there were two things that you could have done inside the job. You could have either been, uh, let's say, a data wizard, you could yep. have written a SQL query, right, and kind of obtain that data, or you could have asked somebody from the BI team, business intelligence, yep. right? Uh, and that probably took a bit of time because obviously there's a backlog, there's a bit of bottle. There's there. a formula, so on and so forth. Exactly. And it takes, takes a while. How, however, think of essentially voicing over what I've just said to a chatbot, and the chatbot gives you exactly that data. So it tells you, look, for these types of units, I've priced them at X or Y, for the last three months. What else do you want to find out? Right? <laughs> and you can do this with any sort of data inside the organization. And I, I thought this is very powerful because it really unlocks the ability to process complex data for any team member, regardless of how data savvy they are. So th this for me was a super interesting way to apply AI to, to our organization. I was laughing because this is one way to make a one-man show department into a 50, 60 experts kind of department, right? And I think this is also a great tool, especially considering that pandemics has taught us that work from home is possible. And, uh, you know, having not having your colleague close to you to get access to this intel and without, you know, disturbing him or her, or being a disruptor in their schedule, you can still access the part of their brain and their intel by working with this uh, chat mode. So I, I think this is a, a, a very good example of how this tool um, can actually uh, help with the power of AI and, and this revolutional technology streamline communication processes and shorten distances and remove time zones between teams because this is a huge problem when you're a glo global player and on multiple geographies for uh, thanks for sharing your point of view over here with respect to ai and i appreciate you taking this from a um, creepy picture that no one wants to look at especially politicians or, or an economist towards you know on a happy end where you can see some advantages in companies that are starting to implement it and this is just one of the examples uh, as you've shared um, with us. So I think it's important now to, so, so this, this recession came, uh, you know, as a combination with this revolution that has been signal or flagged, as you said, a couple of years ago. But what would be your takeaway from the pandemic uh, itself? 
when you're saying the takeaway, what you mean, I guess, from a business perspective, for us as a, as a society more widely, what yeah. would you have in mind? Well, I think, you know, the answer is go nuts. I can give you an example from uh, from my point of view. It has taught me that it is possible in a different way than I was used to or acquainted with to do things, whether it's living, traveling, working. Uh, so I, I've, I've learned that life can have another nuance. So this is one example I can give you. Yeah, I mean, look, uh, I, uh, it's your point. I think I can caveat that by saying I kind of started my career more or less during the pandemic, mm -hmm. right? So that um, th th that wasn't great at the beginning. Let me say this much because I, and I'm sure it's not just me, but I crave I crave human connection even in the workplace. So while, while I value remote working and flexibility, and my job is fully remote for all intents and purposes, I feel that the camaraderie you you see in an office not not in all offices. I'm sure not not all firms have that. But I'm consulting for this idea of camaraderie. This is something maybe we might miss out on mm -hmm. by going through remote. So let me just caveat. But but that's from the perspective of somebody who had to work fully remote. Well, however much I tried to kind of go to the office, I couldn't, where there was nobody there for a good number of months. Right? So it's important to still have that in mind. Now, in, in terms of other kind of changing and other things in terms of ways of doing, I think one thing it, it really taught me is... Um, there is a lot, particularly when you communicate or present something, there's a lot that goes into kind of non-verbal elements and cues that it is a bit harder to maybe communicate via Zoom, right? Or, or yeah. So I think that the way you, you choose to present an idea or let's say a slide deck in person versus or remotely uh, differs widely because like it or not, there's so many kind of subtle hints that are being picked up in person. Um, and I think that, that that's something you, you wouldn't realize unless you had the counterfactual, mm -hmm. which is kind of remote presenting. So that, that for me is, is also quite interesting. Um, at the same time, it also taught me that, look, there's so much you can do online and should, should have never been mandated in person. Yeah. Right, so take, take this ops. This ops is stretched, in my case, across 15 markets. Um, would it make a difference whether I'm in, a, in one office out of these 15 or not. Of course not, right? Um, so, so so, the advantages of being in person, are, I, I think, are more personal, for lack of a better word, than, than professional, right? So I think yeah. it, it really comes down to, to also your personality, right? So whether you prefer you know, maybe be in a context in which you really can kind of chit-chat or you kind of value more flexibility. Um, I'm, I'm maybe more of the, more of the former. Um, but uh, but look, I think these are maybe three things that, that are sorts throughout the pandemic. But also for me, again, didn't really have the counterfactual of working through in person before, so you need to consider that. Yeah, I, I, I you know, I, I think you you can say that you you were born professionally with COVID, so uh, yeah. you, you know that pandemic itself. So uh, maybe you didn't have so much to suffer from the uh, in person or in office point of view okay i got that thanks for your uh, personal uh, bucket list over there in terms of sharing the you know the insights that you've taken in and what you've grasped over there um i think my next question goes towards uh, vcs uh the devil and the angel uh the, the, the eternal vcs that you know can be uh, your best friend and your arch enemy and i want to you know get your thought over here and see uh how how is it possible that such institutions can build dreams and 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 crash them in the same time because of greed? Well, that's a great question. Look, I think uh, VCs are primarily, a, or have been historically primarily a U.S. phenomenon. Yeah, so it's sparked from the um, if you like the whole Silicon Valley ecosystem of the nineteen seventies and nineteen eighties. And just to maybe give a bit of history here, you, 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 I think it's very important to understand why VCs existed and why they have appeared in the first place. Um, so think, I, I think that the, the best parallel I, I, I love to draw here is think of um, seafaring expeditions in the 17th century, right? So uh, you were United Kingdom or Spain mm -hmm. um, 400, 500 years ago, and you put together a couple of ships to go to some 
faraway islands, yep. right? Uh, carry out some trades. The, the chance of this working out is, is slim. You don't really mm-hmm. know what to expect, right? You could run into a deserted island or you could run into a resource beach island and you might come back with kind of a lot of, could be spices, could be whatever else, right? So, so, so it really, if you think of it almost from like a statistical viewpoint, uh, it's a very long tail outcome, which is it's very unlikely that you get something out of it. But if you do get something out of it, you struggle. It's very rewarding. Right. Exactly. It's very rewarding. But it's so very costly up front. Sorry to interrupt you, right? Yeah, exactly. Making the analogy with the expeditions, the ship, the crew, the everything, it's extremely expensive. You got to have Absolutely. money to spend. And so take that metaphor, take that metaphor, but place it in the 1960s and 1970s in, in the US on the West Coast, right? It's got so many new technologies appearing. Uh, you know, think of a transistor. Um, and, and essentially the question is, will these uh, new technologies succeed commercially, right? Um, you, you don't know. Put yourself in the shoes of, of a businessman in the 1970s. Um, as you said, they're very costly up front. You don't know if they're going to succeed. Somebody, though, needs to find out, and somebody needs to provide the capital. And the question becomes, how do we funnel capital to these businesses in such a way that investors are still, or investors aren't reluctant to go for such kind of yeah. outward ventures? So to take again the metaphor of the ship in the 1600s, but imagine instead of uh, you being, uh, let's say, a merchant and funding one ship, you're funding a hundred ships yep. going to a hundred different islands, right? Ninety-seven percent of these ships will sink. Probably sink exactly, right? But three of those ships will come back with probably treasures, a, a lot, new a lot land, of treasures, right? Yeah. There you go. There you go. So ex- exact same idea for BC in the 70s, which is you pull together quite a bit of money, you start placing your bets uh, against 100 companies. 95 of them will not succeed, but the five that will succeed will be very likely industry-defining, yep. um, and they will be extremely profitable and extremely fast to grow, because this is the the nature of tech, right? So if, if, a, if, a, if a tech venture succeeds, it's very likely that it's super fastly growing, and it's very profitable. Right, so it's a, just the best combination ever. But of course, a lot of these bets are risky and might need, might lead to to nothing, even if you've invested so much capital up front. So maybe this it's worth noting. This is the historical context of BC. Since then, this industry got so much more complex, right? Because you've got BCs that specialize in terms of verticals, in terms of uh, the the stage of the company. So from right at the very beginning, you know, pre seed and seed all the way to Series D, um, and and. At the end of the day, now you have more flavors of VC that allow you to invest in the industry you're liking, mm-hmm. uh, allow you to kind of dial down or dial up risk. So there are VCs that invest only yeah. in space tech, yeah, which I would argue is on the more speculative end, right? Um, and to, to get back to your question, you know how how do how do VCs kind of shape the dreams but also crush them? Uh, I think. Today, if you want to build exactly this type of tech venture, which is highly scalable, potentially highly profitable, right? It requires an upfront cash, uh, an upfront kind of amount of cash. The, the VCs are really the gatekeepers, right? Because VCs are probably the best bet that you have in terms of funding, right? You cannot access funding. All the uh, all the only only one uh, else besides your uh, family, friends, and fools willing to trust yeah. you with money. Exactly, the, the three Fs there. So unless unless you have other sources of funding, <laughs> person, VCs are the way to go. And, and now instead of, so the, which is good and bad, good because somebody is willing to put up the money if, if the right business exists yep. there, which I think the society as a whole definitely kind of pro. It's bad because now you need to optimize your initial business idea, business model, business pitch needs to be optimized to convince this set of people uh, that, you know, some of them maybe have never stepped into venture. Some of them come from a consulting background, some of them come from a banking background. Maybe some of them have a rolled up their sleeves. Many of them have. So many of them have been founders, they have been part of tech firms. But they, they, they think in a very specific kind of pattern, right? And you need to start optimizing whatever you're doing as a business to kind of serve and put out your best selves from a VC perspective, right? 
which isn't always optimal, right? I, I hope you agree here. Yeah, and I, it, it, it's not necessarily that I, I, I blame them. For, for me, what I ask you this because it makes me very sad to see v, VCs, um, you know, finding a company, validating one, fueling one, and then becoming greedy and totally diluting their product, their the quality of what they deliver, just for milking and skimming, and in the end that leads to bankruptcy. And, I, and I, I'm not seeing this once or twice. I'm seeing this more and more in the past 20 years of someone starting great uh, with an amazing product that they loved. And then they change the formula to increase profit margins. And people are not stupid. They can fill it with their tongues, right? They, 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 they know when you change something in their, in their ingredients over there, they're just going to walk away. Of course, this is uh, very beneficial for others that are trying to enter that market and can have an opportunity over there. But... I want to get your point of view, and I and I think they're a very good thing. Um, and I wanted to make an analogy, um, going back to the ships of, of you know, and and you mentioning that there are VCs that are exclusively investing in areas which are more of an exploratory or futuristic. Uh, guys, some of the reasons why, uh, I'm talking for our listeners, some of the reasons why those VCs are there is also because they're backed by personalities that have a weight larger or, or, or let's say heavier than gold. When we talk about Elon Musk, when we talk about Jay Bezos, those guys have proven something. They have companies, they, they have validated, they, they, they've shown that it's impossible to succeed in an industry and they created an industry. So some of the VCs are not there just because they care about the future. They have these guys as a as a warranty, um, you know, for for funding them. And um, what what's funny over there in in the expedition of the ships that you've mentioned is you would see, you know, ships becoming speedboats as you you know that they're starting to see some returns in terms of the uh, investments they made, but with 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 the volatility of the market, you know, you got to make sure that your speedboat is not just for cool waters over there. It's also prepared to, you know, confront the black swan or the heavy storm over there because sometimes it's hard to think of a product, a process, or a business that will be Teflon proof whenever, you know, things go south. So from this point of view, uh, I, my conclusion was just because you're validated by a VC doesn't mean that you can take a holiday and your work is done, it actually means that you have to work harder, uh, you know, to achieve those KPIs and return on investment that you've promised to the people that have taken this risk. It might be more expensive than taking a loan uh, in terms of what you have to uh, give up as a stake in your in your business and your company. And you got to be careful over there not to leave out too much control because you might end up as a stranger in your own company. So yeah, don't believe me. I think the the journey barely starts with uh, a VC back to back to your firm. Um, I th I think look, um, you, you need to. I think it's this advanced view that I have on VC, which is just imagine that you start a business, you started a conventional business thirty years ago, uh, probably even in Romania, right? Yeah. Probably the the only two things you could do is either get a bank loan, but yeah, that was a kind of highly <laughs> for, for, for <laughs> the guarantees you needed, you could have started the business your own. Exactly. And it's a very, at least 20 years ago, 30 years yeah. ago, made, I'm sure it was kind of a nepotism driven kind of culture, even in terms of backbones. Right? So, or, or the three S's, as you said, family, friends, and tools. Um, VCs, at the end of the day, I think they're professionals that have seen many business ideas. And they can provide a strong, clear feedback in terms of, hey, look, this, you have, you're, you're onto something, or we send this. We've seen this like five, six times. It's all going to work because of this, this, and this. Many times they're wrong, right? But I need, I, I think you as an entrepreneur need this layer of feedback. And also, you, you need to think of how many people would be, willing, how many institutions would be willing to invest in, in a bet that's risky, right? So this is what this is out there for. And you need to, once you actually get funding from the VC, you need to think potentially also about the intangible benefits you might get, mm -hmm. right? Uh, which is guidance, which is potentially industry expertise, which are connections, by the way. So the, these are intangible benefits that you get once a VC backing. And potentially, for, for lack of a better word, uh, the pedigree, right? So 
there might be an effect, uh, hey, listen, these guys invested in company X. It means company X is the right stuff. Right? And, and that, that kind of pedigree extends to your clients, to your suppliers, to maybe the second round of investors, uh, to banks that they're going to kind of loan you. So it, it kind of, it all comes together nicely. Now, of course, the, the calls you pointed out are very much fair. And I think um, while the interests of a VC and a business are very much aligned at the beginning, as you near the potential of, a, of an exit event, these might start to diverge. So the funders, which might be in love with their idea, which yeah. they should be by all means, right? By one, are taking, let's say, the, the longer term view, which is why IPO next year? We're not there yet. Let's take another you know, three, four, five years and settle down a bit and make sure the business is, is in the right point in time to do, to do such a next step. While the VCs, they, they need to respond to investors, right? So they have what's called, um, they have what's called LPs, limited partners, which are essentially the other institutions such as insurance funds or pension funds investing in them, right? And they respond to them. And these guys, they want to see a return. So you cannot just invest in five businesses, uh, wait 15 years for either of them to kind of return some money, and in the next 15 years, just kind of wait around and see. So because of this slight kind of diverging interests, of course, you'll get situations like the ones you mentioned before, which is optimized for profitability over a profitable, uh, sorry, optimized for profitability over sustainable growth, optimized for profitability over damaging the brand or damaging the customer experience. And these things happen, and I think, you want to have a quality VC, make sure that doesn't happen. And you as a founder need to sometimes also return to your own kind of founding values, founding values, right? Mm -hmm. To make sure that you don't end up in that situation. Guys, to understand some of this pressure and maybe translate through the 401ks that Matei was referring over here, just imagine that in Eastern Europe in general, you're giving your pension to the state to be administrated by the time you get your pension age um, threshold over there, someone will give you back in return something you've, uh, you know, for something you've contributed all your life. But in U.S. and other countries, it's possible to take this pension fund from different institutions and risk it into something that will be, uh, you know, a higher reward. But at the same time, don't forget you're risking your pension. Things go south. You don't have a pension anymore. So that's, you know, uh, some part of the pressure that Matei was mentioning over here of working with, you know, institutions that provide this pension fund as, a, as an investment for VCs in yes. general. Yeah, you're right. But I guess it's more, so it really depends. But many times, as much as I am, investment, investment funds, pension funds specifically, you would invest something like 5% um, into, into VC. And they expect that 5% of their portfolio to behave just like the other 95%. <laughs> so, for example, if you invest in stocks, you kind of know, okay, I'm getting something like 10 to 15% yeah. a year. Sometimes 20, sometimes 5, right? And they, they expect VC to be the same, which is you, you need to kind of invest, uh, you know, whatever you invest, and then you get a pretty, let's say, steady stream of capital yeah. back. But in reality, VC doesn't work that way because there, there are you know, years in the market, such as 2023, in which nobody does any exit events. Like you cannot IPO, uh, you cannot sell your company because nobody's buying. So you, you know, uh, you as MC are, are put in a very tough position because investors still expect that you make that 5%, but the market doesn't allow you to make that 5%. Correct. So what, what you do, right? And, and this is why you, you get these kind of uh, conflicting, conflicting, if you'd like, aims and targets of VCs and their founders, particularly in, in down markets. And particularly as you as you approach X events, so you, I think you're completely right there. Uh, I think uh, for those listening that want an introduction, like a light entree, like a salad in understanding VCs, they should start with Shark Tank. So guys, just download the episodes and and go have fun, eat a bit, and see if you have the stomach for it. Thanks for sharing uh, your insights over here and, and how you see things with the VCs. And I think the analogy with the, with the boat and the speedboat and the expeditions, it's, it's quite an interesting one. So I appreciate the humor over there. Um, I want to talk a bit about uh, communicating with and, and working and delivering for high net worth 
clients, individuals, and executives. Because um, we started a bit with uh, uh, Pascal over there, you know, and, 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 and the, the conciseness of our words, our messages, the, the time slotting, the, the, the general and global problems, the uh, over flooded agenda, and, and how do we make it? Which are some tips we can give over here to actually work with these kind of profiles, which might be scary for uh, many individuals that have not swim in this water before? So I think that, that's a very interesting topic. Um, look, let, let me preface that by saying, you know, in my case with BCG, I, I had the chance to work um, with a good number of government actors, particularly mm -hmm. while I was in Dubai, right? Um, so it could be ministers, could be um, you know, CEOs of investment funds. Um, and I think, let's go back for a second to what we were saying before regarding consulting. Um, parsimony, so your ability to kind of <laughs> share a message in a very succinct, very structured, and in a very kind of punching way. And this becomes even more true when we're speaking to such individuals. Hmm. So I think that the thing they value most, at least from consultants, I think that's the, the one angle I can speak from, is they have, well, we all have limited time, but this applies so much more to such individuals, right? And so they value a very clear answer, right, to, to a question they have, uh, delivered in such a way that they don't need to, to meet back your point biblical emails. Uh, this is the one key idea to mm -hmm. be aware of when dealing with the selection individuals, but also being mindful that, and it really depends with who you're working, but some of these people can really go down into the numbers. And I think that, uh -huh. that that's what's really impressive about some CEOs is um, they started, you know, they started from the bottom, yeah. for lack of a, kind of a better word. and. Uh, they went through different trenches and they can actually deep dive into many complex issues just as well as you can. Uh, so you need to be aware of that. So even if you deliver your message very succinctly, you need to be aware of that at every single point, you might have to actually deep dive into any one of your arguments and you need to be prepared with data. So let me, let me give you another kind of metaphor. We're actually not even much for a concrete situation, how is it? So I remember um, we were working with ministers, as I was mentioning yeah. about Yeah. And you have to present the slide deck to them. Yep. Your main slide deck had something like 40 slides, which is not a lot for consulting standards, right? For like a two hour chat. However, behind those 40 slides, you might have something like 800 slides of appendix <laughs> and backup in case of any questions, right? So, for example, you find a number, which is kind of the overall investment. Yeah. And the question becomes okay, but what's behind this overall investment? This figure seems high. And then you need to start backing that up, saying, look, this is split into X, Y, Z. Yeah. And X is, the, the, the assumption behind X is A, B, C, right? And you need to probably have one, two, three slides for each one of these answers, which have data behind them, which have expert opinions behind them. So like, it, it all becomes really a, an exercise of, please uh, explain this, this concept as easily as you can. Right, but then you need to also be able to deep dive as deep as it gets. Or to and make your exercise deep. even harder, we need a one pager from those forty slides, which are a summary from the other eight hundred. <laughs> this, I mean, this is called an executive summary, and probably it's the toughest. It's the toughest slide that you can do. Because imagine, uh, you need to condense the work of eight hundred slides into one slide, so every single word matters. And every single term there yep. has a slide and specific wants to it. And you know what? Now back to the point you were mentioning earlier, uh, beginning of the podcast, which was uh, the UK or US educational system versus, let's say, Eastern yeah. European educational systems. That ability to kind of at once to to kind of the idea of communicating is something I noticed, particularly in, let's say, in the UK, mm -hmm. um, in, in my UK coworkers. So I think they have a very understated ability of adding just the, the right amount of wants to, to, let's say, to a text that they're communicating, which is something maybe we're missing out on. Right? And, yeah. I, and I find that very interesting, and I find that crucial when you're dealing with such situations. Yeah, especially, and, and I think that this skill is very, very needed, especially when you have to deliver bad news. 
Because, yeah, yeah good, what metaphors are not, new ones are not. When it's good news, they're going to catch it, right? But you, when you have to deliver something in a mitigating, risk-minimizing way, and it's bad news, I think it makes uh, a whole difference, and I think it's an entire art. Uh, so Let me give you a funny funny story I have about that, actually. Um, so I, I was working, as I mentioned, in London with this other consultant from Google, CNC, that was specializing in... Uh, investment due diligence. So that means you have an investment fund that wants to acquire a company, and you, as an advisor, need to answer a very, I mean, on the face of it, simple question, which is, should I invest in this company as a fund? Uh, and you know, there's, again, the 300, 400 slide deck going into that. Now, the question is, you, as a consulting partner, you need to actually tell the firm, the fund, yeah. at the end of that investment due diligence, you need to tell them, do I invest or not? And I remember, and I was absolutely fascinated by it, you, you, you see these these guys, like English gentlemen, 50, 60 years old. They've been in this industry for like four years. And you, you can imagine they've been in probably hundreds of these folks in which they have to deliver our assessment. Of the yeah. And obviously, like the answer to such a question is never a yes or no. Or, I mean, probably 1% <laughs> of cases it's up here yes or no. And like, you remember, every single time they opened such a call, they were able to add so much nuance to the answer. Um, it was like, you know, sh should I invest in this company? It's like, I would like to offer a very qualified yes or a very qualified no. And, uh, you know, let me let me tell you uh, the pros. Let me tell you the costs. Let me take, tell you the risks. Let me tell you the opportunities. Uh, let me tell you why you should take this with a grain of salt. So just like being able to answer such a complex question with so much nuance, but in a single sentence or in a set of sentences, this was one skill which I found absolutely fascinating, and I never really came across again in many other places. Right. I think gray hair does come with benefits, uh, especially if you learn from uh, from the best. So that's for sure. Um, I would be very curious to find out if, how do you structure your one hundred day agenda. What do I mean by one? I I I, I took this from the uh, U.S. presidency, right? So whenever I start a new mission, mandate, or uh, you know, exclusively work with a client, and we got 18 months to fix things in quite a tangible way, right? So you can sense a difference over there. And I come to discover that it is critical to have a 100-day agenda in which sets the tone for the rest of the year. So I would I would be curious to see what would be your you know your actions your way of thinking your way of approaching something when you're thrown into the waters and you start your 100 days agenda. Um, so I think it's it's slightly different if you look at it from a consulting project viewpoint, which I think you're hinting at, or or a new job. Right, or even like a new partner. Let's talk about um, the biz ops role because uh, right. we should focus mainly on folks that are trying to fill in this role rather than just being an external consultant. For sure. So I think, as I'll, I'll still put on my consulting hat, <laughs> and I'll think first of all, uh, first of all, and being able to listen in the less conventional sense, and, and being able to make something of your surroundings. So you, probably you need to first spend one or two weeks just to understand what you're dealing with in terms of mm -hmm. this is my team, this is the wider industry context, this is where my firm sits in that context, um, this is the business challenges we're currently facing, these are our targets, right? So just understanding the wider context takes a bit of time and really kind of digesting it. And it's not just enough to read the report, uh, you really need to kind of put the puzzle pieces together, right? Yeah. Once you have enough understanding, you need to also understand where I sit in this entire conundrum, uh, what my role, what's expected of me from upper management, what I can deliver above that expectation, right? Because it's always an important task. What are the skills and prior experiences mm -hmm. that will allow me to do so? Right. So again, really understanding a bit the context and making sense of how you can kind of shape the context. Once you do that, you start connecting the business challenges with the company targets, and then lastly, with your own targets, right, or your division targets. So there needs to be a very kind of clear balance. Yeah. So you start by understanding, number one, the context, number two, defining your targets in the wider context of the company targets, and then number three, you start moving on to, to implementing, 
concepts. What does that really mean? That means I, where do I you start? Technology, I'm not sure if you're if you're aware of OKRs, right? So yes. OKR stands for objectives and key realizations. So we, we use it quite a bit in the realm. And then IKPIs, right? So key performance indicators. So you start by understanding, okay, so I have this kind of high-level target. How can I break this down into three or four key kind of streams of action, avenues of action? And then I need to understand within these kind of high-level strategic avenues of action, what are some tactical decisions and technical steps that I can make? And then how do I want to start, um, if you'd like, assessing them in terms of impact and in terms of ROI? I think uh, prioritization is also an understated part. Yeah. There are a million things that you can do to achieve your target. Yeah. What are the five things, though, that will deliver the most impact and the most ROI in the amount of time that you have? And I think this is really what the 100 Days Agenda is, is, could be boiled down to. So it's understanding your context, defining your target in the, con in the wider context, right? And then defining... Uh, and prioritizing the tactical decisions and steps that lead you towards these targets. That's that's my my take on the one hundred day agenda. I want to give some additional helping tools or support tools for folks that might not be so familiar with OKRs and KPIs in general, or the, how how to blend these in uh, to make make a framework. Let's call it a framework. Um, and um, I think, guys, if you go and get familiar with management by objectives and start the slicing process from there, you could have a good tool to use before you get to the relationship between OKRs and and uh, KPIs over there, as uh, as Maite, uh mentioned. And uh, just wanted to point out: don't be discouraged. Master this, and then you can move to to the next uh, to the next one. My last question for today, Matei, would be um, how do we quickly appraise the worthiness of an action or an investment or feasibility of doing something? How do we do that uh, in a context in which we get questioned, should I do this or not? So an investment is by definition risky, isn't it? Yeah. All right, so the, the return is unclear. So let's start with that as, as the guiding principle. <laughs> Very and discouraging. The <laughs> and the, and I'm, not, I'm not sure if you're referring here to, to investment in maybe the professional skill set sense, in the pure financial sense or in the personal sense. Let, let's say opening sense. a coffee shop. Let's say opening a coffee shop. Something very general, right? And right. how do we assess this quickly? I mean, the worthiness or the feasibility of this? So, so I, I would still start by saying... Uh, you are dealing with whenever you, you say you pronounce the word investment, you're dealing with uncertainty. Right? Yeah. Um, again, whether what, it's, it's a financial investment, whether it's a potential investment. Um, so, and, and you need to be comfortable with that uncertainty and with that risk. Because if you're not comfortable, you, you almost, I think, need to think of yourself as a poker player. Mm -hmm. um, however much skill you have, and however many uh, optimal decisions you take, mm -hmm. uh, you know, fortune still plays a part. And you need to be comfortable with that. Um, once you kind of ascertain that, you start kind of understanding a bit, okay, um, can I break down the main driver of, let's say, the financial performance of my investment? Can I break it down into several parts? So if you take, let, let's take the, the, the very simple example of the coffee shop. What are you trying to optimize for? Uh, profitability, right? So that, that's kind of the, the, the simple difference. Sure, you could say, I also want to, want to build my own brands and that's why I open a coffee shop. That could be like yeah. a secondary aim. Maybe I want to better my community because there's no coffee shop in my neighborhood. I don't know. But let's let's keep it simple and let's assume we're optimizing for profit. Yeah. Right. And so then you start breaking that down into its components. You think, okay, what's profit? Profit is again putting my consulting hat on. <laughs> uh revenue wise costs. Okay. Yeah. What's revenue? It's the number of coffees I'm selling times the price of the coffee. What's cost? Well, coffee beans, espresso machine, right? So you can start seeing how you're building these small building blocks. Yeah. It's very important to, to, to kind of start going through this process because on one hand, you start understanding uh, whether the business can be successful, so whether all these kind of puzzle pieces can come together. But also, once you start uh, actually implementing your business plan, you know what to track. 
Yeah. Like you, you need to know that for me to succeed in my initial plan, the price needs to be here. If I cannot sell coffee for this price, then I've got a problem. Yeah. And I need to either offer better quality service, better quality coffee, or maybe to maybe move to a different location. That's even possible. Or if the costs start exploding, I need to start controlling those costs, right? So it's a, it's a great tool to, to forecast whether the investment could be successful, but it's also a great tool to, for, to, to, to track your business. And I, I, the, the, I think the more you deep dive into these building blocks, the better. But also you should be mindful that at the end of the day, it's kind of a, it's a hand reading exercise. I think you, you, you can kind of, you know, draw so many assumptions, but you're never going to be sure that all these assumptions will work out. It's a very good process to structure this, but you, you can also over engineering it. Uh, you, you can, also, you can, <laughs> you can become your, your own enemy in doing yeah, this. Yeah, you become your own enemy. And it's still like peering into a crystal ball because uh, how many assumptions you use, some will turn right, some will turn wrong. You need to be mindful of that. But to get back to your initial question, once I, I still use my best judgment to arrive at some conclusions, I put all of these pieces together. So I, I'm, I'm going to say, you know, I'm able to sell, I don't know, 100 coffees a day for five pounds. Yeah. Um, the, the, the production cost of my, my coffee should be something like three pounds. Um, I expect a revenue of, I don't know, 2,000 a day, right? So that's like, let's say... So you start making these educated uh, assumptions with respect yeah, exactly. to for exactly. financial forecasts, right? And perhaps so add, add a, yes. yeah, perhaps yeah. add an amplifier for costs and a handicap for revenue just to be on the safer side of, of things, just to uh, make it easier for folks to understand the, the entire calculus you're trying to paint over here. But basically, you're kind of trying to paint out a decision tree over here uh, in trying to see that even in a resilient environment or in a worst case scenario, you're actually capable of living from this business. So it's worthy of your sweat. I, I love that. I love that. So it's, it's exactly the decision tree. And by the way, for all of these assumptions that I've just mentioned, I think it's better to work with ranges. Yeah. Like you, you never know that you're going to have this cost, but you know in 80% of cases it's going to be this range. So if you work with ranges, whenever you kind of Take such a decision. But at least now, worst case scenario, I'm here. Yeah. Best case scenario, I'm probably around here. Am I able to live with the worst case scenario? Because guess what? Chances are you might be closer to the worst case scenario than the best case scenario. I think we as humans are inherently kind of optimistic, right? We want to believe that the best case will pan out. Sometimes it does. I think in many cases, on average, it doesn't. So you need to you need to make sure that you can live with the worst case scenario. Well, there you have it, folks. Whether you like it or not, once a consultant, always a consultant. Can't escape from this. Maybe when you're dead. And bottom line is, um, well, I think there's a lot of value from what our BizOps guru has shared today. Uh, Matei, thank you for cascading from your knowledge. And um, I think if 15 markets uh, is not a suffice challenge, you know, the word is getting smaller. So um, I wish you best of luck and the next 25 markets that you are going to penetrate with this um, revolutional uh, concept that you're bringing in terms of uh, business travel accommodation. And it's been a pleasure sparring with you uh, over these topics. Nice. Many thanks for the time. It's been absolutely fantastic chatting together. Um, and, you know, thanks for, for thinking of me. I really, really appreciate this. Um, I think you're onto something great. So thanks a lot for the time again. Thank great, you. Uh, great speaking.